Amen. Amen and amen. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. You know, I told Suzanne when she uh, said, we should sing that song. I didn't like, I, it's not so much I didn't like the song. I didn't, I didn't like the guys who were playing the song. It was kind of weird. I thought I was watching the Soggy Bottom Boys one time, uh, which, which I don't mind. I like that type of music, but it was kind of weird. But this is nice. Amen. Let the darkness fear. Amen. Let the darkness fear. And, uh, you know, we serve a mighty God. Amen? Amen? Turn your Bibles to Philippians. Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And, uh, again, if you are visiting us here today, welcome in the name of the Lord. Amen? We serve a mighty God. We serve a God who loves us. We serve a God who has given us victory in our lives. Amen. You know, we may have failed in different places in our life. You know, we may have, we may have messed up in certain things in our life, but we serve a God who gives us many chances. We serve a God who gives us many chances. A God who's not, who's not shy about blessing us. A God who's not hesitant about opening up the windows of heaven and saying, you know what? Let's do this again. Let's do this again. And, um, you know, that's an awesome God. Amen? That's an awesome God. And while you're turning to Philippians chapter 1, will you repeat after me? I am a child of God. I'm a saint of God. And I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And I know that I know that all things, not some things, not part of things, but all things work together for good to those who love God. That's me. Turn to him and say, that's me. Turn to him and say, that's you. That's you. Amen. Father, we love you, God. We thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for the victory you gave to us, Lord God, and the people who are in this place, Lord God. I know, Lord, there are some who may be hurting right now, Lord. There may be some, Father, who are looking for answers in their life. There may be some who may not know you the way we know you, Lord. And Father God, we are asking, Lord, that you will just open up their eyes and their ears, that you will open up their heart, Lord, and let them know there is a hope. There is a hope, and that is you, Lord. And that's what brings joy to our heart and our lives, Lord God. It is you. It is you that gives us that hope. It is you that shows us the hope, Father God. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen and amen. Hallelujah. So we are uh, starting a series in the book of Philippians, in the book of Philippians, and how many of you know we are a Bible church, amen? amen. I, am, uh, working, I am working on a series called The Emergent Church, and I would encourage you, if you have not, uh, if you have not to, if you have Facebook, to go to our Facebook page, Harvest Christian Fellowship. If you just put it on there, we're probably, a page pops right up, Harvest Christian Fellowship. If not, Harvest Christian Fellowship, Arizona. It'll pop right up. Like the page. Um, or if you don't have a Facebook page, you're like one out of the whatever, uh, go into our website because I am, I am posting it on a page that we're going to be calling uh, a theology page. Go on there. You'll see there are different uh, YouTube videos and stuff for you to click on. The very first, uh, very first page has a YouTube video if you click on there, it says Pastor Michael, you'll see all the other videos that are on there. I am doing a series called The Emergent Church. It is, I don't know how many part series, but I can tell you I'm already on part three of it. And it, they're only four minute videos, just four minutes, because I know your attention span is four minutes for a video. That's so true, amen? So church is over, let's go eat. <coughs> So four, mi four minute uh, videos, there, there are so many parts, and it really just talks about the emergent church. And um, the emergent church is one thing, is that they take the Bible and they use the Bible as a recommendation, a recommendation. And that's something we don't use here, because the Bible is not a recommendation. The Word of God is just that, it is the Word of God. Uh, solo scriptos means scripture alone, Bible alone, amen? Uh, you will not see this church open up a, a, a book of series of 
hey, let's read Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. Or we will not talk about, let's read, let's go over the book of Jabez or the Jabez prayer book or nothing like that. But this, this church is dedicated to open up, opening up the Bible because right here is everything we need in this life. It is relevant enough to change the hearts and the lives of people. Amen. So we are in the book of Philippians and, and uh, I love this book. It's one of my favorite books. I, I mean, all of them are one of my favorite books, but um, but it is, it is really neat because the Philippians was written in a kind of a, a different spirit when Paul was writing to the book of Philippians. It was write, written to people that Paul, the Apostle Paul, considered his friends. And you can see how the Holy Spirit speaks through the Apostle Paul. And that's something we need to remember is that even though Paul wrote the Bible, God was the author of it. Just because the Apostle Paul wrote... He may have written, but it is the Holy Spirit that inspired. He was the author of what the Apostle Paul writ, wrote. And um, it's really remarkable because that confirms in us that what the Apostle Paul says is what God says. It's not that God, the Apostle Paul is God, but rather God used the Apostle Paul to write to the people of God. Amen? I mean, we don't have God himself with a big old pen writing down. He uses men and women of God to write the things and to say the things that God wants to say to the people of God. Amen. And that's written, that's declared throughout Scripture. Amen. So in this case, Apostle Paul, you can see the spirit here. It says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Now, again, like I said, when he writes to this, to the, to the people in Philippi, to the Philippians, um, you can see it's a different spirit. The Apostle Paul did not write in a way of saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. His, his declaration to them was more of a, hey, we are servants of God, and I'm writing you with a sincere heart, with a loving heart. It is different, it is different from, for you to get a a message from maybe a friend of saying, hey, how are you doing sincerely versus to whom it may concern or it may say something like to all the employees. A company memo is different than a letter from a friend. Amen. So in this case, the spirit of God is very gentle and he's talking to the, um, the apostles or to the people in Philippi. And he says also, he says, I'm stand, I'm writing to all saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. And for you who don't know what a bishop is, the bishop is the overseer of the church. And deacons were considered the, the workers. They were the, the what we say in, in our realm, the sheepdogs. You know, you had the pastors and the bishops, and then you had the sheepdogs who were, their job is to really kind of, hey, we need this, we need to get that. They are the workers of the church. They're the hard workers. Amen. Um, as a matter of fact, the church, the Bible says this. It says that in Acts chapter, in Acts chapter nine, if, no, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter six, um, there was a time when the people wanted to get fed, and they came over to Peter and they said, "Peter, Peter, you know these guys, we need to feed them." And Peter's like, "Hey, what's this got to do with me, man? I'm busy studying, praying, and preaching. L assign, appoint seven deacons who will take care of this work because we don't have time to wait on tables." So in other words, deacons are very vital to the church. They're very vital. And they're very important because they are doing things that, are, that you don't see on a normal basis behind the covers. Preparing communion, feeding the poor, uh, getting, making sure the ACs are down, doing the music and all that stuff. All this stuff that's important. Amen? So he writes to him. He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I want you to know this. This is awesome. Because who began the work in you? Christ. Jesus began the work in you. And I know some of you are like, well, I'm not perfect. Duh. 
God knows you're not perfect. Well, God knows you're not complete. God knows there are certain things that he's going to be fixing in your life. There's going to be certain things that are going to be correcting in your life. It takes time. Don't be impatient. Wait for the timer to hit two minutes. Because if you open up and you grab that burrito too early, it's going to be cold on the inside. And you just wasted all that time. Amen? And some of us, we quit too soon. Some of us, we think, oh, we're just done. It ain't working out. It ain't happening. It's, you know what? Allow God to do what he needs to do in you. He's going to fix you. Who you are today will not be who you will be in a year from now. You're going to change. There's going to be things that God is going to strengthen in your heart. I know that you're hurting. I know that there are things that, that you just can't see going and getting over it. But, but you know what? You're, not, you're more than the engine that could. You're the engine that will. Amen? And that's God's power in you. You've got to understand, God will give you victory over that mountain in your life. God will give you victory over the trials in your life. I guarantee you the, the trials that you had a year ago, you, some of you are probably like, what were they? I, I, I couldn't see myself getting over them. But you're here today, right. and you got over them, and you got victory. Amen. Well, I got some good news. God's going to even give you victory over the trials that you're in today. Amen. God's going to make you overcome. You're going to reach over that mountain. You're going to get over that hill. You're going to reach over that block that's stopping you. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And let me tell you something. That light that's on the end of the, end of the tunnel is not going to be a train. Right. Amen. Amen. It's going to be God getting you through. Amen. Amen. He's going to get you through. So understand that the, the, what the Apostle Paul says is, I know, I know that he who began a good work in you, I am confident, I am confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. You know, God wants you to, to get across that finish line. God wants, and some of you are going to be going in there, coming across hobbling, wobbling. You're going to be kind of dizzy, but you know what? God's like, just get you through. Get you through. And that's important, saints. That's the power of God. That's the love of God. That he's going to be there picking you up and carrying you through, but he's going to get you through. Don't, so don't put your trust in yourself. Don't put your trust in other men. Put your trust in God. Trust in him and he'll get you through. He's going to complete it. He's going to finish it for you. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, let's read on. <clears throat> it says, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you. I'm sorry, I passed that. J verse 7, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in so much as both in my chains and in the defense of and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. You know, I, I, I'm glad I didn't, I didn't pass that uh, because that was something that jumped out on me when I was studying this. It says, it says this, he goes, in so much as I have what? Confidence in my chains, right? For me to think of this, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, the confirmation of the gospel. What is the Apostle Paul relying on to get you the victory that you need? The gospel of Jesus Christ. I, had, I have received confirmation. Listen, folks, this is coming from a man. This is, these writings are coming from a man who was in prison. He was in prison. He was in prison, in a dungeon, and sitting there waiting for trials. And what is he doing? Saying, God's going to give us victory. God's going to give you victory. Hang tight, hang strong. Don't worry about me. I am even victorious in my chains. God's going to get me where he needs to get me. That's an awesome spirit to have, amen? That when the devil thinks it's, he's got you, oh, you're done, you're done. You're like, whatever. You're like, whatever. You don't got nothing. You ain't, you ain't. We're like Superman. Just all, oh, you got, oh, you got me. You know? I, I remember, it brings me to, to thoughts of uh, that old Superman, some of you older folks, you know what I'm talking about, where, where the three bad guys were there, right? And they think that they, think that they put Superman in this, this little thing where they took his power, but in reality, he reversed it so that their power went out and he gained his power back. You guys remember that part? Yeah, all young people are like, oh, Superman returns? But uh, he comes out and they're like, 
bow down and kiss. Gosh, what's that guy named? Zorg. Og. What's his name? Zog. Zog, right? Bow down and kiss Zog's hand. And Superman comes down and he's like, all right. And they're like, yeah. And then he grabs his hand and he ends up squeezing it. And he's like, oh, and he breaks it, right? They think they have victory over him, but they don't realize that they don't got nothing. They don't got nothing. You got to understand the enemy's got nothing against you. Again, do you understand the scripture we just read in the beginning of worship? Where are my enemies? God gives me victory over my enemies. Even though they encompass around me, there's a God who will give me victory. Whom shall I be afraid of? Whom shall I fear? If God be for me, that's right. That's right. No one can. That's an awesome God. He, that's a confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness. How I greatly re, how I great how greatly I long for you all with, with affliction, or I'm sorry, with affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And the word sincere and excellent means that you will approve of the things that are going to get you through. Number one is the word excellent gets you, is the Greek word meaning through it, that God will get you through it, that you will prove of these things, and that you will be genuine. Sincere means is, the, is actually the word genuine. How many are, are understand that it is hard to find genuine people out there, right? Genuine. Listen, we got to be genuine, made in USA, genuine leather. We're confident about that, right? We're like, this is made in USA, it's genuine leather. But if it said made in Singapore, genuine leather, we'd be like, what kind of leather is that? You know, I, I one time, we bought a couch one time. We were out there and, well, as I have seven kids, so we don't actually buy one couch. <laughs> we have to buy like two sets of couches, you know, two sets. It's just everything's now double. You know, our mayonnaise we get from, uh, from Costco. It comes in a five-gallon bucket, you know. You know, 100 slices of cheese, and it's not like that, you know. But um, we bought a couch, and the guy's like, this is leather. This is a leather couch. And we're like, oh, this is nice. This is comfortable. Oh, feel that. It's leather. You know, so we, we bought it, and we took it home and everything. We put it there. Well, about three months later, something started peeling. We're like, what is this? This is leather. This is supposed to be leather. And underneath, it was like that black stuff, you know, whatever, that cloth. And we're like, what is that supposed to be leather? I don't get that leather thing, right? It's bonded leather, or it's... It's uh, leather, I don't know what they call it. Yeah, it's pleather. They should have called it pleather. Well, eventually, eventually, over the year, the whole couch started like peeling in certain places. You know, so you, we sit down, get up, sit down, kids run all over it. You know, you know it's going to be tore up. But um, we were like, we got scammed. You know, we didn't pay. We should have known. We didn't pay leather prices on it. You know, but we're like, yeah, this is leather. Oh, leather at that cheap? Can't beat that. But we were like, hey, there's a problem there. So we were like, we're done. You know, so when we bought new couches, and the guy's like, this is leather. And we're like, listen, we went for this before. And we're like, are you sure this is not bonded leather? Or no, this is leather. Everything is leather, real leather here, except for the back. The back is whatever. It's not touchable. It's not leather. We're like, okay, we're not going to touch that. Just make sure everything is leather. He's like, no, it is. I said, if not, we're coming back. I got seven kids. They know how to wear this stuff down. We're going to come back. You know? But, uh, but we're confident. Why? Because of the gospel. It's real. It's genuine. Genuine. God is genuine. It is not fake religion. What you believe in is not a fake faith. It's not a, it's not a oh, we're going to motivate you. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. No, it's more. God is not relying on you to do it. He's relying on him working in you to do it. You understand that? Some of you need to know that. Because if he relied on you to do it, that's it, you'd fail. But it is him working in you to do it. He's the energizer bunny. Amen? He keeps going and going when you can't. Amen? That's the true faith. That's the stuff God wants you to hang on to. Amen? Anyway, he goes... Being filled, and then he says, without offense till the day of Christ, 
being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by what? Jesus Christ. To the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. What happened to Paul? You guys remember? He just said it right now. He's in where? He's in prison. And what is he saying? When I am in prison, it actually turned out good because it allowed me to what? Further the gospel. Further the gospel. It says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Let me tell you something. Two years ago, two years ago, the city of Phoenix sent me to jail for 60 days. 60 days for having, for having church at my house. Okay, 60 days for worshiping in my house. I'm sure some of you probably watched the news and said, you know, pastor jail for home worship or Bible study in, in the house. And we were worshiping in a house. It was private. It was family with friends. We were in our house at our home on our property. We didn't have no signs. We didn't have nothing on there. Okay, but the city of Phoenix thought they were going to be hot shots and come and arrest me and throw me in jail for 60 days. Okay. There's, it's a longer story, but nonetheless, there I am in jail. And they thought they had victory. They thought that they can stop. Oh, we're stopping this guy. We're going to stop him from preaching. We're going to stop him from doing what God w is doing in his life. But let me tell you something. While I was in there, a few things happened. One, the gospel was furthered. Those who were in jail, we had, a, we had what, we, what was converted into a God pod into a God pod. Over 80% of that pod became believers in Christ, coming in for prayer meetings and preaching and teaching. There was another uh, young man with me. His name was Michael Turner, wonderful man of God, heart for God, loves the Lord. And man, we were preaching the gospel. And they thought they can stop me. But let me tell you something. What God did, he did a wonderful thing because not only was the faith of the brothers there converted, but the word went out. It went out to families and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, Michael's mother is here today, and she's been a member of the church now for two years, a year and a half, two years. Amen. So Michael, Michael's mom is here, <coughs> and, his brother, and his brother comes here. And, and that's the thing is what, what the devil thought he was going to stop, God made it greater, turned it for good. Come on now. And, and when they stop, God says, you know what? You can't stop. What they just did is they just opened up the floodgates. of God just poured it out. I mean, where we're at today is not what we imagined what God was going to do. God just opened it up and poured it out. Amen? And he continues to give us victory. Let me tell you something. When, when, the, when you think the devil's got victory over you, watch out because God's going to do greater things. Amen. Well, let me tell you what else happened. People, when I went to jail, it was national news. It was national news. People from all over. I started getting postcards from Australia, from Japan, from the Middle East. I started getting letters from everywhere, all over the world. My mail call was like this. What ended up happening, believe it or not, if, you, if some of you remember that, suddenly a lot of other Christians started to get bold. A lot of them started getting arrested for passing out tracts for preaching, for doing things. It was quite remarkable what happened. It was like out of nowhere, all these who saw me in jail were like, wait a minute here, what are we doing? We need to be bolder. So they got bolder, and they started professing the gospel and doing things. And next thing you know, we started getting people who were getting arrested or getting cited for prayer meetings at the house, for Bible studies and stuff like that. It became, now it became a national news, and people were now standing strong with God. That's an awesome thing. Amen? So what your, what your setback may be, you don't know what God is doing in the background. God is setting it up so that, you know what? Let me tell you something. When you go back, when you're going back, don't think it's no good. Sometimes all it is is God getting ready to slingshot you forward. Some of you need to know that. Some of, these, some of you need to understand that just because you're feeling like you're going back, 
It's not God's going to leave you there. He's just pulling you back. Say, here we go. Woo! So that you <laughs> come on now. So that you thought, oh, I'm back. And you don't even know how you got here. Come on. Some of you don't. Some of you need to understand. You don't even know how you got where God wanted to get you. But you got there. And you can't even plan it yourself. Because God got you where he wanted you to be in the first place. Amen. You're like, I don't understand. I was going back. How did I get over here? God slung shot you there. You say, I couldn't even have planned that myself. God plans it. God plans the victories in our life. He slingshots us ahead. You know why? He has to because he needs us to jump over our enemies. None of us here are Michael Johnsons. We don't know how to jump over. God said, you know what? I'm going to just, woo! And all our enemies go, whoa, how did he get past us? Past us. How did that happen? Because God darted you, pulled you back, and brought you above your enemies. That's an awesome God we serve. Amen? And they said, Paul says, listen, what happened to me became to the furtherance of the gospel. Amen. So it has become evident. Okay, verse 14. And most of the brethren now speak boldly, become confident by my chains, and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. <coughs> uh, I have it in my... Oh, is that it right there? Thank you. Thank you. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some from goodwill. Excuse me. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerity, sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. Amen? When Apostle Paul was sent to jail, when Apostle Paul was sent to jail, there were other people who came up and they were trying to take the truth of God and tried to pervert it. And you know what? The Apostle Paul says, all these people went out and they started preaching. Oh, Paul is down. Paul is down now. Here's time for us to take advantage. And they went out and they tried to take advantage and they started preaching Christ. But they started adding things to the gospel. Circumcision and legalism and all this stuff. And the Apostle Paul says, listen, they, they, they're so funny because even though I'm here, they think that they're doing, they're doing me bad, but they're actually turned for good. They don't realize that what they think is bad for me is actually going to be good for me. Because when I get out, now the gospel is preached, and I'm going to take everything that they preach, and I'm going to bring it to the truth of God. I can preach about two hours on this, but let me just give it to you in about two minutes. Amen? What they, they thought to evil against you, God turned it for good. You see, they took a man named Joseph, young man. And they put Joseph in a pit. This is in, in Genesis chapter 40. They put Joseph in a pit. And they said, let's get rid of Joseph. He's no good. Let's get rid of him. Then they sold him to traders who could come on. Hey, will you buy this Joseph? So they bought Joseph. Then he went out and he became a servant in Potiphar's house. So he's a servant there, a slave. God raised him to become the head slave there. All right, are you with me? Then he was accused of sexual abuse or whatever and rape, and he was sent into the jail. Amen? There he is in jail. God raised him to become the head jailer. Then he interprets dreams, and from there he is brought before Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh sees what is inside Joseph, and he makes him the second in command. And at that time, there was a big famine, and all his family, the same people who threw Joseph in the pit, were now coming to Joseph to ask him for provisions. <clears throat> when Joseph saw him, saw them, he said this to them. Listen. What you meant for evil, God turned for good. 
What you meant for evil, God turned for good. In other words, you don't have control over my life. You don't have the last say so. You don't have the last word. There's a God who's able to get me through. When God says it, I believe it. You can say what you want to say about me. You can do what you want to do to me. But there's a God who's just waiting to take his turn. And even though you think you're moving me left, God is saying, I'm going to bless you and move you right. Even though you think you're pushing me down, God's got a spring there to pick me back up. I will rise higher than when you push me down in the first place. You know why? Because I serve a God who has the last word. I serve a God who will get me through. When you think it's evil, God is able to turn it for good. So let me tell you something. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever these people and these enemies and all those look at you and go, it's going bad, it's going bad, it's going bad for you. You're going, just wait, God's not through with you yet. God's not through with you yet. God is going to raise you up higher than when you first began. God's going to pick you up. Look to your help. His name is Jesus. He will pick you up. He will raise you and give you victory. And at the end, you'll look back and go, my gosh, you enemies, you are nothing. God is my God. He is my Savior. He's my Redeemer. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. He's an awesome God. For I know that this will will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Turn your neighbor and say, don't be ashamed. But with all boldness. You know, I used to believe that word was baldness. I started losing my hair. With all boldness. As always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what, sh what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to, be, to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Amen. And what, let me give it to you in short terms. You know, I, I love this movie. I don't really love this movie, but I, I love this saying in this movie. Long time ago, I watched the movie in my younger days. It was called Mark for Death. It was with John, uh, Steven Seagal, one of the best actors in the world. And Steven Seagal was fighting these Jamaican guys, and the Jamaican guy goes, everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody want dead. Everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody want dead. And I thought... <laughs> You know, just these things, they follow you in Christian. And, oh, everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody. And that's what the Apostle Paul says, man, to be with the Lord. I'd love to be with the Lord. But you know what? I know I need, I need to be here. I need to be here so I can encourage you to be in the presence, to die, just get rid of all this, and just be in the presence and just await. That's where he, you know, but, but to be here is much more needful. Amen? That's pretty much what he's saying. And then he says, and being confident of this thing that I shall, I'm sorry, being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified. Turn your name and say, don't be afraid. Amen. Not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. Remember that verse. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Amen. Let me tell you something. This, I'm going to conclude with this verse here. And not in any way terrified by your enemies or adversaries. Don't be afraid of your enemies. Let me tell you why. Because it is proof to you that they are not of God. And it is evidence to you 
that you have the salvation from God. <clears throat> it is proof that they are not of God. When you are walking with God and you are doing the things that God calls you to do and your heart is right with God and your enemies come against you, that should be proof that they are not of God. There cannot be people of God who are coming against you for doing the things of God. Come on now. I can't tell you how many times that we were praying and worshiping at our home and there were Christians who were claiming themselves to be Christians who used to say things like, well, I'm a Christian and I don't think that we should do that. And they were taking the sides of the enemy who was trying to stop what God was doing. You know what? It made me, it made me realize, you ain't a believer. You ain't a believer. What kind of believer are you? Come on now. If you're really doing, now listen, there's a, there's a disclaimer here. you got to be really doing what God's telling you to do. Now, if you're out there carousing and drinking and smoking and people of God coming to you and saying, hey, you got to cut out with that stuff, man. And you're like, oh, you, what kind of Christian are you? No, what kind of Christian are you? You see, the, the difference is you're right. You're right and you're walking with God and you're doing what God called you to do and your enemies coming against you. That's proof they're not of God. But let me tell you something else. That's proof you're being effective. Come on now. Because when you're doing the right thing, you're going to have those people, naysayers, telling you, oh, you better stop, you better stop. Because you know what? The devil don't care about people who are on his side. When, when you're doing the things of the world, the world is going to applaud you. Like, go ahead, we're right with you. Go on that back. You're doing fantastic. But when you're standing for God, huh? when you're doing the things God tells you to do, when you're doing and you're standing upon the grace of God and you're walking that straight and narrow, you better watch out. Because the enemy is going to come in against you and say, oh, look at this person. You Look at this person. Take them down. You, why? Because they know you're now in their, their realm. And you're going to affect them. And they don't want, oh, don't touch my drink. Don't touch my gambling. Don't touch my drugs. Don't touch my stuff. Take your Jesus and get them on out of here. We don't want your Jesus here. We don't want your Jesus here. They're going to try to kick you out. Because you know what? If you weren't effective, they wouldn't care. Ah, you don't worry about him. We can tell, we can do whatever we want to do, however we want to do. They don't care about you. But when you're doing the right thing, the enemy don't want you there. They want to get you out of there. So when you see the wicked trying to kick you out, know two things. They're not of God and that you are of God. And the Bible says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Why? Because they can't push you off the... They can't push you off that straight and narrow. They can't pluck you out of the hands of God. Hallelujah. You see, that's why the Bible says, anyone who is in my hand, no man shall be able to pluck them out. No man. So your enemy may come against you, but you know what? They can't take you out of the hands of Jesus. They can't hold you back. Jesus is not going to look back and listen to them. He's going to look for you. He's going to look out for you. Amen? He's going to protect you. He's going to be there right there with you. So don't be afraid of your enemies. Stand strong. Know that you have a God who loves you. Know that you have a God who's redeeming you. A God who's delivering you, rescuing you. From all your enemies may rise up against you, but you have a God who's standing next to you. Amen? And they're not messing with you. They're going to have to mess with, with our Father. You know, they say, my daddy can beat up your daddy. No one can beat my daddy up. That's my daddy. My father in heaven, he protects me. If my kid does bad, don't you dare touch my kid. I'm, I'll spank my kid. And that's exactly the way God looks at the enemy. Hey, if my kid goes bad, I'll discipline them. Don't you touch them. I will, give, I will declare who touches them and who doesn't touch them. Amen. I will declare who touches them and who doesn't touch them. You are children of God under God's protection. Don't be afraid of your enemies. There's a God who loves you, a God who cares for you, and a God who's going to use you to further the gospel. Amen? Amen. Praise be to God. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we love you, God. Lord, you show us throughout your word of the power of the gospel, the power that you have li that you li that lives in us, the power that is raised in us, Lord God. Your word even declares to us that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. We have victory over our enemies. We have victory over the things of this world, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, if there's any man, woman, or child in this place here today, God, that you will touch them, that you will make a move in their heart, in their life, that they will serve you, that they will become victorious in you, God, that they will be dedicated to you, that they will stand strong in your word and in your ways, Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord God. May you continue to give us victory over our adversaries. May you give us, may you rise us up above the mountain. May you, anyone who's going through trials, Lord, may you get them through, Lord God, and give them the victory that you have for them, Lord. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all the saints of God say, amen, amen and amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Will you please rise as we get dismissed? We'd like to again uh, just uh, give you a warm welcome to, uh, to come and join us for fellowship in the fellowship hall. There is uh, food. Uh, we have a potluck. So the church members uh, have made uh, plates, uh, uh, Dishes, thank you, dishes. Uh, so I'd ask if you're visiting us, come and join us. Uh, please come and, and we're going to call you to the front of the line to eat first, amen? So um, again, please come and join us for this time. Great fun food and fellowship. And uh, that's what it's all about, amen? It's, you know, we're God's church. We're God's people. It's more about, it's more than just saying, hey, here we are and let's get on and pray for one another. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to pray for you. 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 Pray for one another. Understand that we are connected through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you. We love you. We worship you. Saints of God, go out in this world. Let people know of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are some people in our lives that are going through hard times. You have the light. You have the hope that they need. Let them know about Jesus. Let them know of the victory and why you have the victory in your life. Let them know that there's a God who loves them, that there's a God whose arms are wide open to them, who's calling them home, who's calling them to come into his arms and to embrace the Lord. Father God, I ask you, Lord God, that you will empower those who are here. Give them boldness, Lord God, to speak your word, to say what they need to say, God. And when their enemies rise up against them, let them be reminded that if you are for them, who can be against them? Saints of God, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, amen. and amen. Pastor Toby, you would pray over the food, please. Dear Lord and Father, we give you glory and honor. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the food that we're about to eat. Lord, you bless it to our bodies. Be with those uh, here this day, 